So let's talk a little bit about the element phosphorus and its importance to life and how it cycles through living systems. So we're going to talk about the phosphorus cycle. So first, it's important to appreciate that phosphorus is a very reactive element. So it's seldom found by itself. Normally, we find it in phosphate form. So this right over here, the orange, is a phosphorus atom. And it's bound to four oxygens right over here. And at least the way that it's set up right over here, it would have a negative three charge. And so this would, have, this would often form ionic bonds with other things. Or one of the oxygens can have a covalent bond. Or you can form phosphoric acid, where the oxygen's bound to hydrogens. But this is the general form that you typically find it. So that's the phosphorus that I'm pointing to. But this whole thing, we would call this a phosphate. We would call this a phosphate. And you see this showing up in very important macromolecules in biology. This is DNA. And both DNA and RNA have phosphate backbones. You can see the, the sides of the ladder. I guess you could view it as that way, or the backbone of our DNA molecules. You can see these phosphates there. And in the center of the phosphate, you have that phosphorus, the phosphorus atom. Also over here, you have ATP. In biology, we study that. It's the powerhouse. It's the energy currency of biological systems. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. You have three phosphate groups right over here. And when you pluck one of those phosphate groups off, it can power reactions. It can change the conformation of enzymes. It can do all sorts of interesting things. So hopefully you can appreciate that phosphate is essential for life, because life as we know it involves ATP and involves DNA, and many, many other things that phosphates are involved with. Now phosphate, or phosphorus I should say in particular, is a little bit different than carbon or nitrogen in that it's not found in the atmosphere. It's not typically found in, as a gas. Instead, phosphate is going to be formed, is going to be found in rocks. And it's going to be uh, uh, phosphate-based rocks. There will be other elements in there. It could be chlorine. It could be, well, there's, there's a bunch of different types of phosphate rocks. But when, when they're in their sedimentary form, so let me, let me create some soil here. So let's say this soil has some phosphates in it. Well, then it allows things like plants to grow in that soil. So this is a plant growing in that soil. And the plant, and we've talked about it before, it could be, it could be taking, it's fixing carbon from the atmosphere using light energy. But its phosphate is going to come from the soil. That phosphate was already there, and that helps that plant grow. Because that plant needs that phosphate for its ATP, its DNA, its RNA, and for other things. And phosphate is often considered a rate limiting factor for the growth of things like plants. And that's why a lot of fertilizers will have, will have phosphorus in them, or, or phosphates, or will, and nitrogen's another one. So what, next time you think about fertilizer, you're fertilizing things in your garden, look at the ingredients. You will see phosphate there, because that might be the scarce resource or the thing that is limiting the actual growth of the plant. And then you might say, well, I have ATP and DNA in my body. How do I get phosphates? Well, you get it by eating plants. So this is, this is you eating a plant. So the plant goes back there. And how, how does this form a cycle? Well, when any of this living matter dies, and I've said it in previous video, I'll show the dead plant, because a dead animal is it's like it's just a little darker. So <laughs> whenever you see, so this is a plant now, it's dead. Let's say it got buried somehow, some soil, so it's all, this is the dead plant right over there. Well, it's the, the phosphates in that plant can then go back into the soil. So you could view this as a very tight cycle. And the same thing would be once you die or I die, the phosphates, if we're buried, would go into the soil. But there could be other ways that the, that the, the phosphate and, and the corresponding phosphorus gets recycled. You could think on a, on a bigger scale. Where you could have a let's say that this let's say there's a river, there's a river right over here. This is either a very small river or a very big plant that I drew, and so that river can take phosphates from that soil 
and it could put it into the ocean, and then those phosphates could be used by sea life. And then when that sea life dies, it goes to the base of the ocean floor, and at some point in the future, that base of the ocean floor could be pushed up and a plant grows on it. So you can imagine all sorts of these cycles. And we're actually seeing more and more of this as human beings have said, hey, if phosphate is the rate limiting factor for the growth of plants, and we need to grow a lot of plants in order to feed ourselves, well, we've started mining it, and we've started adding a lot more to the soil, but it also allows a lot of that to get to be washed away into our rivers and streams and eventually end up in the ocean. And as we'll see, this can actually have very negative, negative consequences for our biosphere.